So congratulations on the film. I know it's been around for a while because it premiered at the, uh, was it Toronto Film Festival last year, last September? Right, right. And I was wondering, yeah. I know it, it went over really well. And of course, the world is a very different place now than it was last September. It is. Does that, do you think that has any effect at, uh, on you as a filmmaker or how your film is being perceived or just in general, how that works? Yeah, I, for a long time, it was very unclear what was going to happen. I think ideally the film was going to have its release in the United States in April was the original plan. And then, of, of course, that wasn't going to happen. And then right. it, it, everything has started has been shifting ever since. Uh, it's still planning a release here in the United States in the fall. Right. Uh, but now we've got European and, you know, Australian, New Zealand releases ahead of that. Yep. Um, oddly enough, I mean, of course, nobody ever <laughs> planned any of this, but it's going to be one of the first movies back in theaters, which is a, a just a, a strange <laughs> thing. <laughs> um, I suppose some of the themes in it and kind of the setting <laughs> is applicable to a kind of pandemic lifestyle. Definitely. That the whole thing takes place in a house, <laughs> and it's all about. You know, people are very cramped uh, right now, and so maybe they could identify a bit with the idea of being stuck somewhere. Yeah, 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 uh, <laughs> definitely. It's an interesting one. It's not the most comforting film to come back to. <laughs> <laughs> right. I know, right? That's an interesting thing of, you know, do you want to go back to theaters and, you know, kind of put yourself in a hot seat <laughs> where it's like a, a film that relies large part on tension and the ramping right. up of tension and, you know, a horror film. Um, but hopefully it's kind of that visceral thrill of it that uh, people, I, and I, having seen it in lots of theaters with festivals, there's definitely a kind of uh, something that an energy in a theater when you see it with lots of people versus watching it on your cell phone. Or right, right, like right. That. Yeah. 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 It opens here tomorrow. So it's very exciting. And yeah, excellent. <laughs> so for folks who aren't familiar with the, the setup of the film, um, I mean, it takes place in, in Brooklyn, in the mm -hmm. Hasidic Jewish community. Mm -hmm. And we have a guy who's basically sitting there watching a dead body all night long. <laughs> right. And it's your debut feature film. So what brought you to that subject matter to start out with? Yeah, you know, there's kind of a golden rule in writing, and that is you write what you know. Right. And when it came time for me to kind of figure out what that debut movie was going to be, I ended up kind of going back to things I knew, and the Jewish community is something that I know, just my own family. But I had been aware of this ritual, uh, the watcher, the vigil, the shomer, who, who watches over a body, uh, for a long time and it was amazing to me that nobody had ever had that as a setting for a horror movie if you're that's true. sitting all night watching a body um <laughs> that's a perfect setup so once i kind of got that idea then it was like uh, coming up with how do you craft well, who the characters and then once i'd gone down the road of writing the script and then meeting up with my producers who are actually orthodox jews as well um it was decided like we need to set this in brooklyn we have to go to the heart of the community um, which posed all sorts of challenges in itself. But, uh, you know, I, I, the key thing for me was making it as authentic as possible mm -hmm. in terms of the language and in terms of the setting. And, you know, so we really endeavored to make everything as accurate as possible. Right, right. Uh, and it, I, I've been to Brooklyn many times and <laughs> sure. the area, so I'm kind of familiar with it. But at the same time, I remember when I was first watching the film, I was getting as... I felt like I was watching a European film. I was getting that yeah. kind of vibe from it. I uh, Maybe it's the darkness <laughs> sure. or something. It, was that something you were <laughs> yeah. shooting for? Yeah, you know, I think that is my sort of taste. Uh, uh -huh. And I kind of look, I spent a long time with my uh, director of photography, Zach Cooperstein, to really come up with a visual style that was reflective both of the films that I think influenced the vigil and also just my own personal taste. And so, they tend to veer toward the artier, more European side of things. Yep. And, you know, for example, uh, shooting on the streets in, in, in Borough Park uh, or in Williamsburg, where we were, it was difficult in, with the Hasidic community. There are a lot of people that don't want you filming on the street. And so a lot of people tend to do it with 
kind of guerrilla style with a handheld camera that they could easily hide. And that just yeah. wasn't the look that I wanted. So, you know, we had to build a dolly track 150 feet down the street. And of course, it attracted a ton of attention. Yeah, I'm sure. But it was all about getting that, that look, that color palette and those kind of dark darks. Yeah. And as you say, people may be not completely open to having a film crew shooting there. Mm -hmm. Did you have to do a lot of pre-work and talking to folks in the neighborhood to get everybody to feel comfortable with what you're up to? Yeah, we had a lot of advisors. Um, is a bunch of the cast actually were members of the Hasidic community at one yeah. point or another. And so they were able to kind of be ambassadors. And then we had rabbis, we had rabbis on each corner, right. talking to people who would come by. At one point, it was like two in the morning when we were filming, we had 150 Hasidic men who had surrounded the set. <laughs> and they were like, what are you doing? Like, right. why are you here? What is this? And so we had to explain what the story was. And and eventually they were like, okay, fine. And they, and they stood and watched and they right. kind of find it fascinating. And did you get any kind of firsthand stories from these folks as you were making the film? <laughs> you know, there was, a, there, was a, there was a part where I was uh, just about to jump on the subway and I was talking to the special effects uh, coordinator and the designer about the look of the kind of the entity in the film. And I said the name of it, which is a Mazik, which is very much a real thing. And I happened to be in a crowd of Hasidic folks, and I said Mazik <laughs> out loud, and a bunch of them like jumped back, and they were like, <laughs> "What is? What are you talking about?" Uh, so, so yeah, there was a lot of you know we filmed in a real house, and it definitely had a creepy backstory to that house, and then the atmosphere in there. So you know that all went into it. It kind of gave it that you know that atmosphere. Yeah, yeah. And, well, speaking of jumping back, I know I jumped back several times. During that, so. And it's interesting because on the face of it, nothing really happens. The, yeah. There's a guy sitting there in the dark all night and that's about it. But right. there's more than that going on, definitely. Sure. Did you have to that work hard challenge. to make that tension, mm -hmm. you know, real? Yeah, it, it, you know, it's doubly hard when you have a set, if you've built a set, you can float the walls and you can move stuff out of the way and you can do yeah, all, yeah. but in a house. So it's funny to me when I watch the film thinking of all the people hiding behind the furniture, <laughs> because <laughs> just in that setting, you've got all this crew behind every wall. And so right. when you're filming, it is not scary at all. Right? right. It's just, it's, you know, cause you know, you're seeing everything happen, but the key to that was Dave's performance is kind of, and having him just kind of embody that tension yeah. Um, and then just really figuring out the camera work and getting it down and then a ton in post-production in terms of sound design and the score. Yeah. yeah. Well, I want to touch on Dave and on the sound design. Dave sure. Davis is the, is the main guy. Mm -hmm. And uh, from what I've read, he was in a film called Bomb City that you saw him right. in. I haven't seen that one. So tell us what made you think that he was the guy. Yeah, it's interesting. In Bomb City, he has a uh, three foot high mohawk, a green mohawk. <laughs> <laughs> he plays a, yeah, he plays a punk rocker. And before that, I'd seen him in True Detective, where he uh, was a trans man. Um, it was, you know, he, he, uh, he, in Bomb City, he just kind of had this raw emotional thing that I saw. And I had told my uh, producers that it was important to me that we kind of had three locations for the film. One was Brooklyn, one was that house, and the mm -hmm. third was Dave's face. Right. And it was just getting that compelling kind of performance without having to do or say much. Just like, how do you embody fear and tension and anxiety? And how can we ramp that up? So he, you know, he really, he did a lot of studying before. He didn't know any Yiddish before he showed up. Right. Uh, even though his family's, you know, from the area but you know he studied and he spent a lot of time with the community and he really dove in yep yeah, definitely so yes now on to the sound design because i at one point when i was watching this film i realized i could just not look at it and just listen to it and get a serious feeling from <laughs> just that and I, i'm wondering what was involved in in getting that sound and how yeah with the pictures Sure, there was a lot of work kind of beforehand in terms of coming up with what these sounds were going to be and how they were going to function. So even before we were shooting, we were kind of thinking through it. And then in post-production is just, you know, got a lot of credit to our Foley artists in terms of 
coming up with these noises and try to it's tough because i wanted them to be realistic but at the same time kind of have that supernatural element to them yeah um so once they'd kind of been designed then it was like figuring out how to play them where they were going to be in terms of in relation to the speakers and uh and then the volume and just kind of maximizing that it, it took a while it took a while and we ended up kind of going through, going to a lot of places I wouldn't expect. A lot of the noises ended up being like file cabinets and right. <laughs> broken branches and just random things. Cool. Uh, and the other person I wanted to touch on was the older woman who is the actress. Yeah. In the film. Uh -huh. She's not on very long, but she makes a very big impression. <laughs> she does. Yes. Yeah. Lynn Cohen, who sadly passed away after the premiere, um, oh. she, she'd been in you know, 150 television, she was, you know, in Munich and Spielberg's Munich and she was uh, in Sex in the City. She had a significant role in that. And, you know, one of my producers knew her and kind of approached her with this idea. And she had a Ukrainian grandmother that she yeah. kind of channeled right. for the, uh, <laughs> for the role. But, but yeah, she was, she was incredible. And every time, you know, we'd go, she just, she'd be there and she'd just give us these haunting, you know, these haunting lines and she could do creepy really, really well, considering she's just, you know, she was this tiny, sweet lady. Right, right. So now, since the film has been out for, I mean, some audiences have seen it, obviously sure. not as many yet as you want, but have you gotten much feedback from the community about how they oh, reacted uh, to the film? Yeah, it's for, from the more modern side of the community, the community that has cell phones and you know, yeah. participates in kind of cultural. Yeah, they've 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 loved it. They've been very into it. They've been excited about seeing it represented. Seeing, you know, a lot of them had never seen a horror film in the first right. place. But then, <laughs> but then to see a horror film that was set within the world they understood, they right. loved that, and they felt as though you know. I think one, you know, I think the initial feeling is always, oh, are you exploiting the community for this right. or? And I, it was very clear that this wasn't, that this is, it's taking place there and it's got these themes, but it's true to the community, it's true to the, the beliefs. Um, so they appreciated that. So I've been, I've been happy with the response from them. Uh, you know, folks in Borough Park in the, the ultra Hasidic, I doubt they'll ever see it. Right, right, right. Which is probably, yeah. just, probably don't need to. <laughs> right, they probably don't. <laughs> But it, so, I mean, this whole idea of a Shomer, that still goes on today, I assume, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, you know, traditionally, this is done in the mortuary or, right. you know, where the body is stored. It's, it's unusual to have somebody be a Shomer in a house. Yeah. But it can happen, you know, if something's gone wrong and, you know, and then typically it's usually family and friends who yeah. are doing it and they go in shifts. Yeah. But when you've got somebody that, that uh, has no family or friends. There are these paid shomers. They really only exist in these very religious communities. But yeah, it's a full-on thing. And in the film, Dave or Yaakov, the character, is a very bad shomer because he's breaking all the rules. You're technically not allowed to do anything the body can't do. You can't right. eat. You can't drink. You can't go to the bathroom. You are just sitting there and praying. Yeah. Really. Uh -huh. mm. And and of course, uh, to me, the film seems to come from a legacy of films that kind of touch on similar themes, you know, obviously the exorcist and the omen and maybe mm -hmm. the poltergeist or whatever. Did you think about, <laughs> sure. did you think about those things as you were making mm -hmm. the film? Did they have any effect on what you were doing? They did. Yeah. I, I think the initial idea really came from a film called Jacob's ladder that was from the nineties, but that was kind of story wise, but the exorcist was, it's a favorite of mine, but growing up Jewish, I never really understood it in terms right, of like, right. I didn't know the ritual. I didn't, you know, all this stuff that they're doing. I don't know what they're doing. And so I thought, hey, if I could do the Jewish version of that, right. <laughs> where, where it's universal enough that people get it. Okay, they're doing a ritual. Uh, they're dealing with evil. They're, you know, whatever. They don't need, I don't, they don't need translation. They get what's happening. Yep. That's what I was going for. Like, you know, so there are definitely, you know, overlaps with The Exorcist in terms of a religious horror film. Yep. And, and the sound of The Exorcist, I remember, mm -hmm. was similar <laughs> in nature to what you were up to as well. So yeah. there is that. Yeah, and I was trying to go, The Exorcist, what I love most about it is it's such a very, it doesn't have the sort of uh, over the top, uh, in a, it's very grounded. Yeah. It feels very real as if this is happening to this little girl and no one can explain it. 
And so I wanted that same sort of approach of like a very real place, very real people who yep. happen to come across something unreal. <laughs> very cool. So <laughs> this is your first feature. What did you learn from making it? <laughs> you know, it was, I, I, I think the biggest takeaway for me was that if you get kind of people as passionate as you are about a project around it, yeah. then it just makes it a hundred times easier. If, if yeah. you really find those people and you rely on them uh, in terms of like, you know, really delivering on the vision that you had, you know, it, it you, I had made a short film before this, uh, but that was kind of like an aperitif to the <laughs> larger right. meal of making a film. And it was probably my third day of filming when it clicked into my head of like, oh, okay, this is what a director does. This is what right. I need to do. And I think it was when my art director came up to me and we, we were talking about the kitchen set and that we needed a spatula and we need to figure out which spatula it was. They had a couple spatulas. And it was going to be in a drawer. I don't think we even see it. Right. But she said, which spatula is it? And I said, it's that one. And it was just knowing that. It was just yeah, like, yeah, this yeah. is the one. That's the vision. Yeah. I was like, okay, that's my job. I make a lot of decisions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cool. So have you got anything in the works coming up? Yeah, I mean, we're in development with, uh, I'm doing a new adaptation of Stephen King's Firestarter for Universal and Blumhouse. Um, and excited about that. It's a great script. Uh, it kind of a, a fresh, exciting kind of take on the Firestarter story. Um, so I'm excited about that. And then there's a few other projects that I've got flo floating around in various places, some of yeah. which I've written, some of which I haven't. Right, right. Right. Were you concerned doing a horror film first that you were going to kind of get typecast? As <laughs> yeah. You know, it's funny. I kind of, I, that's my genre. And it was when I, you know, I remember the first time I met with my uh, agents um, in person, I said, you know, this is my thing. Yeah. Like it's, I'm, it, this can be a horror film and the next one will be a horror film and then it'll probably be a horror film after that. There you go. Maybe at some point I'll do a dark thriller. Right. <laughs> <Or> maybe <laughs> maybe a sci-fi horror film but th this is the this is the mode i'm in there will Very be cool. no romantic comedies yeah uh, well you had me jumping out of my seat so <laughs> well good uh, that was effective yeah it definitely was so uh yeah like i said it opens here tomorrow hopefully and it's going to be one of the first new films that is open since uh, the whole pandemic thing has uh, right. shut everything down so it's pretty yeah, exciting that's exciting Hopefully people are raring to go to the movies. <laughs> sure, get out there and check things out. Got them right Hopefully where you want them. to be scared. <laughs> yep. And I hope it does well in the States once it finally comes out in general release. So. Yeah, me too, me too. Yeah, good luck with everything. Thank you for talking Thank to me. Thank you. Appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, no, it was wonderful.